Uh, thanks everybody for being here. We're gonna have a little upbeat, kind of fun panel. Um, I'm Dan Nathan, and I'm joined by a, a great friend of mine. That would be Rick Heitzman. He's the founder and CEO of uh, venture firm First Mark Capital, and Alexis Ohanian, who is the founder of 776. And you guys also know that he was the founder of Reddit and former executive co-chairman. And he's kind of like, um, what do you call it, pancake aficionado <laughs> on the Insta, um, and that captivates me. So Very proud of that. we um, are really excited to be here. We, we want to hit a topic. It's funny, as we've made our way through the content today, a um, lot of great discussions by a lot of great market practitioners. And you know, the, the thing is, I come from a public markets background, but I find what these guys do is fascinating. You know, when you talk about patience and investing, um, you guys have to be patient. It's just by nature of what you do. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about the volatility that you've seen in your markets and the private markets and how the public markets might have affected that sort of thing. And really just this period that we've been in over the last Call it four or five years. Is there's been some big peaks? Think so? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. And, and some and some massive drawdowns, and how that idea of patience really helps. And so, you know, Alexis, I'll start. I'll start with you because obviously you're a former founder, and you know you got into the investment business. I know that you were doing a lot of seed investing, probably all along the way. Talk to us, like, what you know. You founded 776 in, I, I think, the, like a really weird period for venture. Talk to us a little bit about what the impetus for that was and what you were doing differently with your business model than some of the other established venture firms that are out there. I Look, 2020 was a wild year, as you all know. Uh, and that was a big year for me. That was the year that I resigned from the board of Reddit. That was the year that I decided to start that firm, 776, with the idea that we could build technology just like we would at a product company. Uh, but use that technology to then help us do the job of deploying capital, being early stage investors, supporting our companies, running our business, et cetera. And uh, the wild, I think, best part of this job is the fact that everything we do, even if it's building software, is still through the lens of how do we build deeper and better relationships with our founders and with our CEOs. And we get to do it from the very beginning. And there is something incredibly satisfying about believing in a founder, cutting them a check in the very beginning when no one else believes in them, and seeing that business all the way through to IPO. And I can say as someone who's, you know, knock on wood, on the verge of an IPO with Reddit, no comment, um, it, you sleep a lot better uh, when you're just the one deploying the capital. And, and it's just a privilege to be able to do the job. Well, it's interesting. So you guys are both on the row board together. Um, Great and, company. And Zach, the founder, CEO of that company, he's a good friend of mine. And um, I've gotten to talk to him a little bit about the two of you and the impact that the two of you guys have both had on that company and the success. And, and again, that's a company that, in my opinion, knowing them and, and being a user of their product um, and a very happy one, um, they're inflecting right now. Rick. Talk to me a little bit about what Alexis just said. It, it's not just a check, you know what I mean? Yes. Like every Saturday, this guy and Z, they call him Z affectionately, mm. they FaceTime me when they're doing one of their walk-in talks on the way back from your weekly breakfast that you do with him in NYC. Talk to me a little bit about that relationship because that is really what differentiates, I think, mm. what you guys are really set out to do. No, we, we believe in establishing deep relationships. I think the two of us believe that when you partner with a founder, you're there to support them in good times and bad. And when a problem comes up, you're sitting on the same side of the table as them, and you have to address that issue. And also, you got to believe when you invest at the first institutional round, you're going to have a decade-long arc with that company and that founder, in the good cases. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was on the board of, of Pinterest for, I think, 13 or 14 years from seed check through the, public, uh, through the public markets. And so that's a long time where you see a lot of good and bad things and almost all of our successful companies mm. had a period where there was existential risk. They might run out of capital, the product's not working, all kinds of bad things happen. And you bond over that time. Mm. And it's really important for you to be one of those first calls for the founder and them to know and trust you. And you know, maybe tying it back to where we started, you know, I think a lot of people were just throwing money at, uh, throwing money at everything maybe a couple of years ago. But I think you know, what your, the lessons learned from an FTX or lessons learned from some of these markets is 
if you're going to get involved in venture capital, you have to have that deep relationship with founders. To be competitive in that market, whether it's through software or whether it's through relationships, you have to be able to add discrete value to that founder in that company. And then you have to be in it for the long term. Yeah. You have to have the longest view in the room. And that's the direction the world's going. So Alexis, you, um, you just alluded to a company that you founded uh, a, a while ago. And, and it will be pretty fascinating when you think about it. There haven't been too many consumer sort of internet companies that have come public. And again, this is not your words, but there's been reports that it's getting close to an exit. Talk to us a little bit about what that founder journey was like for you and how it's actually helped inform you as an investor now and, and the sort of firm that you wanted to build and the sort of relationships to Rick's point of having a long kind of, you know, the longest view in the room, that sort of thing. Is that is it something that's been foundational to 776? It has. And, you know, 2005, I was a first time CEO down in UVA, Charlottesville, Virginia, starting a company that actually wasn't Reddit. The, the idea that we pitched to Y Combinator's first batch was ordering food from your cell phone. We actually got rejected from that idea because it was 2005. That idea sucks. Well, in 05, it was a poorly food timed dash, idea. it's called, right? Uh, no, it was actually called My Mobile Menu, or mmm. I was very happy with that name. Uh, but there were no smartphones. You'd have to do it via text. It was, it was not going to work. Paul Graham and Jessica Livingston, founders of YC, said, we don't like this idea. The next morning, Paul calls me back and he says, listen, we like you, we just don't like the idea, change your idea. That ended up becoming Reddit. And so took their $12,000, uh, took their guidance, got to build something, and you know, 16 months later, bought by Condé Nast for $10 million. Wow. At the time, that was, I mean, it was, it was absolutely life-changing money. It was inconceivable that I could get paid that much money for 16 months worth of work, and my parents would never make that money their entire working lives. But I didn't have as much help as YC gave me. You know, Sam Altman was in that first batch. We, we were very fortunate. Um, I didn't have folks in the room to say, hey, Alexis, if you have a $10 million acquisition offer, take that and go raise some more money. At the time, we had raised $72,000 total. That was what our YC demo day round was. That was a seed round back then. And that was more money than I thought we would ever need because we didn't pay ourselves a salary. Mm -hmm. It was just the two of us. We could live like college students for years on that. And I just didn't have, uh, I didn't have the sophistication to know that there was another game to play. Mm -hmm. And so I got the chance obviously to come back to Reddit in 14 as chairman to help lead the turnaround. And that taught me how to actually build an org. And so in my job on this side of the table, I want to be that counsel for a founder to be the advisor that I wish I had had when I first sold Reddit, but also the advisors that I got when I came back and got to turn it around and got to learn firsthand from folks like my now partner, Caitlin, about how to build a high performance org, how to, how to be a leader, how to do things that at 21, fresh out of college, I don't know, I was just not equipped for. Uh, but the good news is founders today like Z are so much smarter, so much more sophisticated than we were back then because there was no playbook. You couldn't just watch a YouTube video. You know, there's so many more resources now. So those resources, Rick, and, and again, you guys, so Rick and I, this is really funny. I mean, I think it's funny. We met on the set of CNBC's Fast Money at the NASDAQ market site in November of 2013, and he was a guest, and we did not have a lot of VCs on back then. Mm -hmm. um, we, he was a guest because Twitter had just gone public, and we wanted to ask Rick, what was the next internet company to go public? And mm -hmm. he said, as a board member of Pinterest, Pinterest, which, uh, you know, it was a good call. Yeah. But patience was a virtue there. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit um, about what Alexis just described and what the promise of a YC was back then. You guys are early stage investors, both of you. How is this kind of like this mission creep that we've seen over, let's say, the last five years? A lot of pre-seed turned into seed and then A. And you know what I mean? Like it kind of moved up the, the, the ladder a little bit too quickly. Is that fair to say? Uh, a lot of people were doing a lot of things oftentimes things they weren't special set. Yeah. Mm. So <clears throat> that, was, that was just a propagation of too much money. And you know, mm. we've talked about it, a lot of people have talked about it from this and other stages over these last couple of days, that too much money created uh, certain problems in the system. So now if, as everyone's resetting, what does that mean? You know, I think it, for, at least from our perspective, it means what are you good at? How do you have, you know, how, what's your strategy? And we were fortunate that we, our strategy hasn't changed in 18 years since we started the firm, that it was, we, were, we focus on certain sectors that we know, we, we believe we know as well as anyone else of application layer and infrastructure software for consumers and enterprises. We focus on New York City. About half our companies have always been in New York City. 
And you know, we, we focus on being an early investor and the lead director and being able to have that relationship with founders, add value to founders and help them grow. And that's basically, that's basically it. And despite you know, a lot of pull, and there's certain things that are tantalizing about being able to raise a lot more money or do a lot more things, uh, we stuck to our knitting. And I think that's, that's been the, the whole difference um, in retrospect, in that we have a, a small, tight team that all show up at the same office every day and all have the same mission to overserve our founders and provide them as much value as possible so we're 100% referenceable by them and they do right by us mm. and therefore we could return a, a tremendous amount of capital to our LPs. Yeah, and let's talk a little bit about thought leadership. So uh, Alexis, um, you've been on the pod with Rick and I. We have a great podcast, OK Computer. Check it out, people, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, uh, but this was, I, I want to say, in, in um, early 2021, and, and some tides were kind of turning in, in some of the Web3 stuff. But mm. you, know, you were a really interesting thought leader um, because not only were you investing in the space, you were a practitioner, um, you were very accessible, um, the last time I saw I you, too much. Well, I, I mean, listen. You know, I think a lot of people learned a lot from, from watching you in real time, and I think that you know, like, again, um, you know, whatever your opinion is. But I was in Miami Beach. It was um, maybe Crypto Week or one of those, I want to say. And there was as many people in the audience right here on a beach, at a bar. It was one of those things at one of those hotels, all black t-shirts, by the way. You know what I mean? Not, not none of this stuff that you guys are dressed in right here. But it's pretty interesting. You can draw both of those sorts of audience. Rick is usually wearing a black t-shirt, by the way. Mm. Um, it's a good look. Talk, talk to us a little career. bit about like, what you learned, because that was, what, a year or two into founding 776. And, mm. And, and again, I used to see you on CNBC. I saw you on a lot of podcasts. You were a, a clear thought leader in the space. Well, look, the most of my, <laughs> the, 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 the note you made, Rick, about having the longest view in the room, most of my biggest wins doing this job have had to mean looking very wrong for periods of time. Um, as the first investor in Coinbase in 2012, I have looked at every single crypto winner <laughs> and, and stared it in the face and realized this is the time when the builders build, when most of the charlatans and scenesters flee, and the real work gets done. And so this is, you know, at this point it almost doesn't phase me. The, it is interesting now to see it start to thaw, right, and to see Bitcoin at the prices it's at. Uh, to see, you know, there are builders working on all kinds of things from messaging protocols to some really interesting infrastructure that I think will make this technology more viable in a way that's not about a weird casino fetish, but actually like just useful. And, and as a product designer myself, I, I believe above all user experience rules everything. No one is going to use a thing because of a technology. They're going to use it because of a, a, a problem it solves or something it does, a why. And we're in that phase now, and it'll flow through. And I think, the, to Rick's point, Zerp got a lot of people drunk on the sort of high-end potential of what could be. And we've had a reckoning now, and I think it's good. It sobers up CEOs. It sobers up GPs. Yeah. It's hard times create great companies. So, so there's a lot of focus right now. Obviously, these spot Bitcoin ETFs have captivated not just the kind of crypto community, but a lot of you know, investors who are looking at alternative assets. I, mean, I know there's a lot of talk about it at this conference here today. Mm -hmm. When you think about, and Rick, I definitely want to get your take because you were an early investor in some crypto adjacent yep. projects too. When you think about that consumer interest in Bitcoin in the lead up to that December 2017 high and the ICO craze, and then mm -hmm. you think of that crypto winner that we had that went really through to 2020, mm -hmm. and then we saw that second craze, which got a lot bigger, yes. right? Yep. And the and, and, and more people, you know, x the whales who hold, <laughs> you know what I mean, lost money clearly than made in, in a lot of these projects that are, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, that sort of thing. How do you compare those two periods, and and how like, give us like an optimistic sort of. Um, bent on, on what happens next here, because again, you know, you just mentioned the price of Bitcoin at forty thousand. It was twenty thousand, you know, nine months ago, or that sort of thing. Yeah. And again, that's the barometer that a lot of people are using. Mm -hmm. But what's going on under the surface, and what makes you optimistic about another phase? I, whole phase. I continue to be bullish on Bitcoin because the mm -hmm. the simplest explanation for it that it has proven out is as a store of value, and like. 
As an Armenian, I enjoy gold. <laughs> Why? Because it has some weird cultural value that I just like. And many, many cultures all over the world find this shiny rock to be valuable. I, I just know for sure that we are funding an asteroid mining company. We're never going to find Bitcoin on any asteroids. Yeah. And I know that the supply of this cultural asset is fixed. And so the dumbest, simplest, execution of this is something that I believe is, is interesting and valuable long term. Now there are plenty of people who don't touch gold for, I've heard Warren Buffett's rants, fine, yep. okay. Different flavor, this is the nerd version of that, okay. The hope that I have now in this next cycle is its utility above all, its well, hold on. Can I just interrupt for a second? Please. What is the utility other than store of value? Because I will, again, I, like, please. You know, there was an amazing uh, podcast, Chris Dixon, A16Z Crypto on uh, Hard Fork, uh, the, the New York Times this past week. And he just wrote a book and it's really in defense of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And he didn't really make any great cases for any utility other than store of value. So if right. you like gold and you're a, you wear black t-shirts like these guys, <laughs> normally you're going to like nerd gold better, right? Like that's the utility. Yeah, that's fair. Um, well, well, let's let me give you the I'll give you the quick pitch that I think has become very crystal clear in the last year. So I don't know. I, I do hold Ethereum, whatever. None of this is investment advice. I think there is an argument for a blockchain. Maybe it's Ethereum. Maybe it's a layer two. We'll see. I'm making no particular picks there. But what's so powerful in this age of AI that we live in now is we should all take for granted there will be infinite, let's just say images, creatable, indistinguishable from one another, we are gonna see a glut of these images all over the internet in the years to come. We're already seeing them. Now imagine a world where you cannot trust a single software file, an image, a PNG file, knowing if it is real or not. And imagine if and only if the devices that capture these could inscribe on an immutable global ledger a way to verify, yes, Alexis Ohanian took that photo on the 30th of January at this time in this place, yeah. and you had a way to sign digitally in an immutable global ledger, a blockchain, that this thing is what it says it is. In a weird way, I actually think this, this revolution we've seen in AI is gonna make part of the bull case for why a blockchain will matter, because you'll need to sign this sort of proof of humanity. I don't know which projects will win specifically, yeah. but it feels pretty clear to me that in a world where you need, if you're the president, if you're a CEO, if you're just a teenager, it will be very valuable. Again, it's always user experience. It'll be very valuable to prove, for instance, that this image is verifiably from you. So there's a, there's a billion dollar startup idea, someone's gonna build it, and then in a few years you can invite me back, I'll be like, see, I told you so. Yeah. So I think, what, what I'm certain of, though, is this next wave cannot be about casino mindset and to the moon. It will, be, it will be quieter. It will be, oh, look, our phones do this thing that's more useful now. And, and it will provide value. And underlying that will be this technology that can do something that we desperately will need. Yeah, and Rick, how you, at First Mark, I mean, you guys, it's interesting that you, and we're gonna talk a little bit about AI and, and some of the shift as far as VC from Web3 oriented projects into AI, and now literally we're hearing a lot of folks talk about the intersection of the two uh, and, and getting to that utility phase. How have you guys thought about crypto? You guys have made some some, some, some investments, I, I mean, yeah, long we, time we were, ago. Yeah, you we weren't Johnny come lately. We were it, early. Yeah in DCG, we were early in Ledger, we were early in a lot of projects, um, in that we think, especially in venture capital, you look at wildly asymmetric risks, and if this became, uh, we, we wouldn't have expected to get this big, but if it became anything close to this big, these would be important companies that were providing the infrastructure for a new economy. So we, we believe in probably two things that are probably still important, and it kind of focuses us going forward. Um, in new markets, we believe investing in the picks and shovels in the infrastructure because that's what's going to be needed to, to build it out. And then, you know, Alexis is uh, prescient bet on Coinbase and the custodial services that they provide are incredibly important. Um, and we do some of those things at DCG and Ledger. The second thing is, is there a real ROI? So whether it was 15, 20 years ago as we were investing in software businesses, today as we're investing in AI, or today as we're investing in crypto, is there a real ROI on this? Are you able to do something better, faster, cheaper that someone's willing to pay more because that's, that's increasing efficiency? So if there's transactions that are occurring on the blockchain, whether they're financial transactions or whether they're custody transactions, 
are you able to do it better, faster, cheaper, because people will pay for that, and it's not speculation, and we, we steered clear of the speculative use cases uh, and, the, and the speculative coins and the ICOs, and we said, hey, are there other things that you could do to make it cheaper, and we're investors in companies that do data storage, we're in uh, investors in companies that provide insurance verification, we're investors in companies that do um, faster, better, cheaper transactions um, using the blockchain smart contract infrastructure. And that's kind of the way we think we're gonna see the world evolve, that it's a little bit like a lot of the market today of a show me time, of show me how this is really working, mm -hmm. and the people who are gonna be able to show it are people that are gonna be able to prove we can make or save you money. So let's talk, this is a really important concept and I think it's important probably for a lot of folks in the audience here. Um, you just mentioned kind of that ZERP mentality and how it made its way into you know, a whole host of different risk assets that maybe shouldn't have been financialized. That's me editorializing there, people. Um, but when you think about this period that we had from the collapse of FTX, Okay, and then you know some really big brand name investors in on that one, and and and, and you know, and we can we don't really have to go into that, and then bookend it with what we saw basically a year later with OpenAI, and let's talk about due diligence a little bit, and have there been some some lessons learned? Do you think um, you know from the VC community a little bit? And again, you know, you've been in and around the space for a long time as an operator, as an investor. I'm just curious, was that something like like a lot of lessons learned there in the last couple of years? Well, I mean, there's a little bit of kind of what we hit on the beginning of, hey, there has to be a leader. So I think in some of those cases, everybody was relying, it goes back to some of the Theranos stuff and other, other things that were proven to be leaderless and therefore diligence list, therefore yeah. uh, governance list. That, um, you know, as we invest in a company, we generally are the lead directors, we lead the diligence, we form that syndicate and we hold that company accountable from a governance perspective. But you know, at a time when either companies are super hot or they're, they're playing a little fast and loose, and usually those two things together create all these problems of, of saying, hey, you ha if this is a really hot deal, if you're not gonna do it, someone else is gonna do it, and you have to act, have to act quickly, um, you know, it's really hard, but we always say, hey, we're, that's, not, that's not the game we play. We play a value game, not a speed game. And so we're gonna pass on that. But I think some of the problems you've seen, not, not as much open AI, but definitely in some of the other things that have been exposed as frauds have been, hey, everybody wants to be part of something. No one wants to lead it. No one wants to lead the diligence. No one wants to lead the governance. And you rely on other things, including social proof. Yeah, Alexa, well, I mean, again, you know, one of those ended up in a horrible collapse and it really put the industry in the penalty box for a bit. And then it's remarkable how dramatic the open AI situation was for about a week. And then it's probably just off to the races now. I'm just curious, what were some of your takeaways from that as an investor and a former operator? Uh, for open AI specifically? Well, just, just thought that whole period in general, just, and just thinking about from a due diligence standpoint. It's, well, I mean, I would echo a lot of the same things Rick said, that's just, a way that we, we, we don't want to, we don't want to form opinions based on other people liking a deal. I think, look, there's no amount of perfect, no, it, you're going to be incapable of doing 100%. You, you, you will not be able to take the time necessary to deeply understand every bit of a business. What I think we saw during ZERP though was some, nothing close to that yeah. in some of the most egregious examples with companies like FTX. And I do think, yeah, it's like, it comes back to the leverage. When money is cheap, founders can raise because lots of people have it or willing to slosh it around, creates that FOMO. And I think that's when the best investors have to steal themselves with the understanding of really like, why are we doing this deal? Can we actually get to conviction? And then being okay, missing out on deals. We've, we didn't know, because I was so early in Coinbase, I never saw FTX, yeah. but I had enough people in the orbit that kept raising an eyebrow. No one wanted to say anything publicly because you'd kind of look like You'd look like a jealous hater mm -hmm. yes. if you were saying like, oh, does it, the math doesn't math, how are they spending all this money? But it, it created this weird dynamic in the industry. Everyone was whispering about it being kind of yeah. bullshit, yeah. But, but no one, was, no one would really want to just go out there and, and say it flat out without evidence. Uh, but the good news is the resilience of the underlying technology has proven that you know, there is still a there there in crypto. And as thankfully our you know, judicial process took a look at it. You know, what they found was outright fraud and it, it could have been Beanie Babies, yeah. right? What he was doing is not 
the, 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 the illegality, the meltdown of FTX was not an indictment of the technology, it was an indictment of the humans around and finding yeah. out. Yeah, they found out. Um, let, let, let's talk um, a, a little bit though. Um, you know, I mean, listen, the cult, I mean, one thing we haven't said is this, 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 this cult of that founder was really something that I think played out throughout. So charismatic, I don't but, know how. But, 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 but let's talk, and I want to get your take on this. A headline yesterday, uh, Elon Musk, you guys heard of him, um, for XAI is mm. looking to raise $6 billion at a $20 billion valuation, but he's not raising from you guys or, or you know, Sand Hill Road. It's sovereign wealth in the Middle East and it's family offices. So what's happened with all of these valuations in the AI space, have we learned anything? <laughs> because my point is, it's like right after the open AI thing, the next headline is that they're raising at $100 billion. You know what yeah. I mean? So, so talk to me a little bit about that because I'm not certain we've learned anything yet. Oof. Uh, okay, well this one I think is rooted more in the technology which is OpenAI and slash Microsoft, and we can, you could have a whole other panel just about the governance structure of that nonprofit, but the, they have such a strong lead in the space and are now fortifying that. And I, I think what's gonna be really interesting, I think open source has to be a great buttress against that. But if you look at the other for-profit efforts, it's, we're at a point now where like, we've all kind of taken for granted the magic of AI, right? We're actually kind of bored about how long it takes, <laughs> or at least frustrated, because now we've gotten to the place where it's like, yeah, of course I can have this thing generate a two minute bedtime story for my six year old daughter. Why does it take so long, yeah. right? We've gone from magic to now banal, and it's, it's I think gonna be hard for the next best one to justify why it should exist in a world where there's a couple of big incumbents that solve the problem really damn well. So I think there are gonna be some issues where you know, you've got companies raising on tremendous multiples at tremendous valuations, where I don't know if the math maths because they can actually get the user bases. I think he it's gonna be, it, be, it sure. be a winner take nearly most, and it's gonna be, I think, the biggest players already kind of gobbling up more authority. Listen, it's funny, you know, Rick and I have been playing this little game for the last 24 hours, like when we would go to Google something as you do on your phone, and we've been putting it into chat GPT-4, and I'm telling you, my Google search is routinely better, okay? So, you know, you know oh, what I mean? Your yeah. Google searches. Yeah, and, and you know, Gavin Baker is gonna be out here from Atreides, I saw he oh. tweeted last week something about, hey, who's using Copilot, unimpressed? You know what I mean? Like, I'm just saying, I think we could be at the precipice of valuations, both private and public markets way ahead of what these practical use cases are. Well, I think that AI is good at some things, not good at others. I mean, some of the mm. things that we were looking at were fact-based, right? Google's great yeah. on fact-based search. Yeah. Not as good as of, of long-form narrative story. in chat GPT, of a bedtime story. I literally do that, it's great. Others. It's great, yeah. it's, a great it's great use case. <laughs> is that hallucinated yet, though? I mean, I'm just saying, oh, you could God. stunt their childhood <laughs> in the wrong, you know? Still keep a parent in the middle. Yeah, exactly. yeah I was gonna say, it's good to be there. But, uh, but I think you're, you're going to see, and there's going to be winners and losers. There's going to be com some companies that are frauds. There's going to be some companies that fail. And there's going to be some enormous companies. Mm -hmm. yeah. And those enormous companies are going to capture a lot of value. The other thing we're seeing in AI is the market leaders have been more all over this, this than anything we've seen in the past, right? I mean, it was mm. 20 years ago when I was in the business, like, well, Mm. What, you know, isn't IBM going to do this? Probably, yeah. probably 25 years ago. Isn't IBM going to do it? And everyone say, well, you know, IBM's super old and slow and they're never going to do this. You know, Microsoft was all over OpenAI and it had a deep relationship and it's integrated that with Bing, it's integrated that with Azure, and they're doing a much better job. Same thing with Meta, same thing with Google, that they're either co opting some of the best companies or just doing things like uh, yeah. with Bard themselves. And therefore, I think you're going to see those those winners be crowned by the existing incumbents and those companies come even but, more important. This is putting my fast money hat on. The two problems that you have right now is if you are correct and Microsoft's trillion dollars in market cap that it has gained in four months because of the excitement in and around them harnessing this technology and given their market position, what have you pulled forward rather than the excitement? And then yeah. the flip side is if you look at the private markets and you look at an Anthropic or a Cohere, or you look at the valuations there, and if they're gonna be the losers, there's gonna be wipeouts all over the place. And, and to, at a scale that the VC community has not seen, it could oh, make no, we've seen, FTX. We've seen it. I mean, if you look at the search market from 20 years ago, you know, mm. you know, Ink to Me it's and Dogpile and AltaVista, oh, all those bots. guys were, were small, were small blow ups, but then one, one company wound up cre creating a multi-trillion dollar company. Yeah. And so that's kind of the, 
the creative destruction of the venture capital and the startup ecosystem process that obviously everyone's going to rush in. You know, I think at one point in, the, in America, there was 20,000 different TV companies 100 years yeah. ago. Now there's zero because that, that consolidated, the market created some structure, there was some Darwinism that occurred, and that happens. Mm. And that's, you know, and we're at the point of the 20,000 AI companies that in 20 years we're gonna say, oh, that, that's the, that you know, $10 trillion company was the winner, and yeah. God, I wish we would have invested in it. Or maybe, I, hopefully I, I will have. Well, we can, we can debate, we'll be have. back next year, and we'll debate this a year on. Um, you know, you said, Alexis, AMA, ask me anything. We got like a minute right here. Um, I saw you, you're an amazing creator, uh, a whole host of different ways. Forget about what you do with a grill and, with pancakes and, and the like here. If you, get, if you haven't seen it, you gotta check that out on Follow Insta. Um, Cybertruck. Yeah. You were one of the first folks to pick one of those bad boys up. Did you drive <coughs> it back from Austin to Southern Florida? I Can we get a quick tried. review? I just, I'm dying for it. You didn't hit any snow drifts or anything like no, that. No, no, it was great. We, made it. I made it to Houston with my road dog, Russ, and then I realized I don't like driving that much. <laughs> and <laughs> dropped it off at the a Tesla shop and they put it on a Oh, truck really? And I flew back. Oh, I didn't see that on the Insta story. Well, I, cause I, I just realized that many hours driving. And you like it? Scoop right here. Huh? I, I just no. It's it is a tremendous, really fun drive. Yeah. I it's 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 as as enjoyable as the X, which I love, but somehow even more fun to drive. It's that drive-by wire steering. It's just a nice. Okay. Uh, it's it's fun. My daughter slightly embarrassed by me when I drive her. Just for that. Yeah. Well, I just, <laughs> she's like, I'm like, can I take you to school in this? And she's like, no, no. Papa. I'm like, all right, I'm already, she's six, and she's already embarrassed by me, but yeah. that's okay. We think well, it's only gets worse. Yeah, oh, we, we have older <laughs> kids. It's going to be a lifetime of that. Um, all right, well, listen, right, Al Alexis Ohanian, Rick Heitzman, thank you guys so much for being here. We thank all of you guys for being here. Thanks, thank so. you.